Our news and social media have become battlegrounds where assumed solutions to assumed problems are argued over, fueled by agendas, sound bites, and self-righteous attitudes. Many of us are getting pulled into these debates. As a serial problem solver, I find this trend very frustrating. From gun control, to global warming, to immigration law, people are taking up positions based on their opinion or opinions of others. Largely missing from these debates are facts, data, and some basic problem-solving methodologies. Would you feel comfortable depending on opinion to find a cure for cancer or for diabetes? If not, then why is opinion good enough to solve other problems? But there is hope. Remember the problem-solving process that we were taught to use for science fairs? It's called the scientific method, and it really works. Now, don't be fooled by the name. It's not just for geeks and lab coats. Uh, and in case it's been a while for some of you, uh, it goes like this. The process starts with a problem and ends with causes of that problem being proven. Then you can move on to finding solutions that fix the problem permanently. OK, this is how it works. Start by defining the problem and measuring just how bad it really is. Um, let's use an example. Let's say your GPA is too low. Um, your current measurement, let's say, is a 1.7, and you don't want anything less than a 3.5. So in cause and effect terms, your GPA is the effect, and that's usually depicted as a capital Y. And in case you forget that, I've got a little, little help here. Um, so next, you develop theories. Now, these are just theories about potential causes of that problem by repeatedly asking the question, why? Use your experience, your observations, or tap some other experts to help generate a list of potential causes. For example, your study habits, the difficulty of your courses, going to class, extracurricular activities, or even the friends that you hang out with could all possibly be reasons for a, a low GPA. In cause and effects terms, these are the potential causes and are usually depicted as a lowercase x. So, and don't worry if some of your X's are things that are outside of your control. It's still important to understand the impact that they're having on your Y. You just won't waste time later on trying to fix them. Probably the best example of that would be agriculture. To a farmer, yields are obviously a major Y. And weather is going to be a, a very, very big cause or X. So it's important to understand the impact that weather has on your yields, but you're not going to waste a lot of time trying to fix the weather. Obviously, that time would be far better spent on uh, crop rotations, tilling practices, uh, chemical application, and any other X's that prove significant to that yield, to that Y. Now, your hypothesis pulls together your theories about potential causes. Now, in geek speak, this is represented uh, as, the, as the equation Y is a function of X, where Y is the problem, X are the potential causes, and F is the strength and the direction of the relationship between X and Y. For example, the longer you study, the higher your GPA. Well, the harder your course is, the lower your GPA. Uh, showing up for class may have a, a large impact on that GPA, where playing on a sports team may only have a small impact. So now it's the fun part. We get to test our hypotheses by gathering data about the relationship between x and y. Is y better or worse when x is present? And how much impact, if any, does x have on y? For example, was your GPA higher when you used to study in the library more? Or when it was the off-season for your sport? Are your grades lower in classes that you skip more often? Or were they better before you met a new friend? Gather as many facts and evidence as possible, and you look for patterns in this data and draw fact-based conclusions. Now, the challenge here, and this is a significant challenge, is to keep an open mind. What we often see is our original theories about causes, our pet theories, we're just sure we know the causes, end up being dead wrong. If the data doesn't support one of your theories or one of your X's, toss it aside, grab the next one, and start gathering data. 
In other words, if you can't prove that your GPA was worse when you were playing a sport, you can't blame your coach for your grades. If the data does support your hypothesis, Eureka, you have just found one of the causes of your problem, a because. If your grades are lower when you skip classes, you just found a cause for your low GPA. The same scientific method has been used to identify uh, the major causes of cancer and diabetes. And now that those causes are known, the focus can shift toward coming up with best solutions. If skipping class is one of the causes of your low GPA, you can focus on getting creative about making sure you go to class. Get an app that nags you to go to class. Uh, enlist a friend to drag you to class. Uh, donate $20 to a charity every time you miss a class. But these solutions should get results because they're focused on proven causes of that problem. So we're going to take a look at another example. Behind me is a catastat. This is a nifty little device that I built that's going to help me demonstrate the power of the scientific method in action. So the y variable in this case is the distance that this ball is going to travel. The potential x variables are any number of pin locations you can see here, um, which tension the rubber band differently. We've got a pin that dictates how far the arm comes forward before the ball is released. I've got a continuous variable here is how far I pull it back, and then also where the rubber band attaches to the, to the arm. So a number of x variables that are going to, to play into the y that we, that we achieve. So I've already run the hypothesis test with this thing using a program called Minitab. And I've solved the equation y is a function of x for the problem of distance. I understand the strength and the direction of the relationship between each of those x's and my y of distance. And because, of I, because I understand that, I can now control the distance that I shoot the ball. So now this is where I need your help. Um, I need a problem to solve. I need a distance to hit. I need a number in inches between 30 and 80. <laughs> it's never, never easy. OK, 72 and a half. <laughs> so I thought the red solo cup would be appropriate for a college setting. <laughs> I've got a scale here. I'm going to line this up with 72 and a half. <laughs> I'm going to consult Minitab to optimize for 72 and a half inches. And it's going to tell me what I need to do with my X's. OK. 4.1. So I need to set my the thing that stops the arm at 4.1. I need. A stop angle of 3, and I need the mast at 1. We don't have a drum roll, I don't suppose. Oh! OK, so I'm glad that happened. Actually, I'm not glad at all. I was going to uh, take a bow, walk out to thundering applause, and maybe a standing ovation. Uh, OK, so it was really close though, right? You saw that? Well, an interesting thing happened as I began um, characterizing this device. I designed a number of X's into it, all of the things I described to you, but a few other X's started to creep in. I discovered that things like how I released, how I let go, the surface that it's sitting on, how long it had been since it had last launched a ball. The rubber band apparently starts to, to get a little more tension if it's been a while since it's been used. It hasn't been used since yesterday. Um, so now we've got X's that, that I didn't consider in my uh, original work. So the, the good news is, well, two things. If those are X's that I can control, great. I will get control of them and, and zero in. If they are things that are outside of my control, then I might have to settle with a little bit larger cup. So maybe I'm not going to get that 3.5. Maybe because I have to play a sport, 
because of my scholarship and I, I've got a hard major, so my classes are really hard, I might have to settle for a 3.4, 3.3, something like that. But um, so we'll, I'm going to set this up out there later and we'll, we'll play around a little bit. <laughs> um, point being, things happen for reasons, for becauses. And if we can understand those causes, we can solve nearly any problem. That cup, had we hit it, could be world peace, it could be school safety, or it might just be a better GPA. Done correctly, the scientific method is apolitical, it's unemotional, and it's a collaborative search for facts. And now, not everyone wants to become an expert in the scientific method, and I get that. Uh, however, I challenge all of us to shift our conversations about important topics towards defining the problem and understanding the X's. And only then can we truly solve problems in meaningful ways. Let's all become advocates for because. Thank you.